Um, it's so good to be with you today. Uh, my name is Carol O'Donnell, and I'm the director or the head of the Smithsonian Science Education Center, and I work in Washington, D.C. in the United States. And I'm also an educator, a teacher, and I've been a teacher since 1983, and that's 37 years of being, you know, with students in classrooms. My colleague, my colleague Logan, who's joining us today, she's also an educator, and she's an author. So someone who writes words on a page and those books turn into amazing opportunities for kids all over the world. So Logan learned at a very early age that the only thing that she liked better than science uh, was talking to people about science. And she spent the last 20 years pursuing that passion. Logan's worked at museums, aquariums, wildlife refugees, refuge, um, penguin colonies, and in the classroom with students just like you. So today, Logan's going to talk with you about the Smithsonian Science for Global Goals project for which Logan is an author. So the Smithsonian, along with the Interacademy Partnership, um, has pulled together the best scientists, physicians, and medical experts from around the world to work with each of us to better understand and help you understand food and how to ensure good nutrition for all. So Logan's going to introduce you to one of the many questions that we've had from students like you, your age, about food and nutrition. And she's going to share with you an example of an activity that you can do at home to discover the answer to the question about how do you ensure good nutrition for all. Logan? Carol, thanks for the great introduction. I'm gonna start sharing some slides. We should be live now. Um, so we're gonna just talk a little bit about how the food that you eat is related to your health and how you can take part in noticing that relationship. And like Carol said, we're gonna use part of our Global Goals module on food to help that conversation. So first I wanna ask you, all of the students who are on the call, and you can feel free to put your answer in the chat, turn to someone in your household, or just think about this to yourself. Why is it so important to know what we eat. So food contains nutrients and those nutrients are what help you grow. They help you be well and stay well. And it's important to know what you're eating so that you can make sure you're getting the nutrients that you need. You as students are doing a lot of growing right now. And so one of the nutrients that's really important for you is calcium. You probably have heard of calcium helping you with strong bones, it helps you develop strong teeth, but it's also really important for muscle contractions or muscle movement. And it's very important for heart health. It helps your heart to beat. So you wanna make sure that you're getting calcium and you can find that in yogurt, milk and cheese, but you can also find it in things like bok choy and other dark leafy greens like kale. So it's really important to know the nutrients that you need and, and where you could find them. So scientists also participate in this practice of thinking about nutrients and what foods go into a body. And at the Smithsonian National Zoo and at the Conservation Biology Institute, there are special scientists that do just that. They're called zoo nutritionists. You can see one of our zoo nutritionists featured here, and he has page after page after page of what's called a diet record, which means it's a list of the foods that are important for different animals to eat. In fact, this was one of my first jobs when I was 14 years old. I started working at a science museum and I would come in early in the morning and assemble all the foods that were necessary for the turtles and the toucans and the electric eels and the sharks. So if you're at the National Zoo and you're working with our prehensile-tailed porcupine, watermelon is going to be on the menu. If you're working with the poison dart frogs, you're going to need to assemble crickets, fruit flies, and some kinds of beetles. And if you're working with the Grand Cayman Iguana, I actually have a copy of that diet record. And you can see in the top left corner, it's the name of the animal. So the zoo nutritionist knows which animal am I working with. And then you'll see a list at the bottom left hand corner of the image that lists the types of food that need to be included in that diet. So let's take a look at this. Mixed greens, 
that's something that you and I might actually eat. Iguana maintenance diet, probably not. Um, any of you who have pets at home, if you buy a commercial pet food, this is like that, it's just for iguanas. Mixed vegetables, we eat that too. Sweet potato and then squash. You'll also notice some numbers on the right side of the image, on the lower right side. So 120 grams, 20 grams, 10 grams, what does that mean? Well, those amounts are really important. Why is that important? So we've got the list and we've got the amount. We've got this diet record. How does that help our zoo nutritionists? Well, it's really important for the animals to get the nutrients that they need when they need them. So for example, you saw on the previous slide, this is for the breeding season and you'll notice the iguanas are only eating Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's because during the breeding season, they're not that interested in food. And so the amount of food goes down, whereas in the non-breeding season, they're feeding them every single day. When I used to work with penguins, during the penguin breeding season, we made sure to give them extra food and the female penguins got extra calcium. That was because they're laying eggs and they need that calcium to create eggs with strong, healthy shells. This is also a practice that you can engage in. So keeping track of the foods that you eat can be really helpful for you, and there are lots of ways to do that. A photographer named Greg Segal decided to do this through photography, and he took photographs of students from around the world, posed next to the, all the foods that they ate over a seven-day period. So Beryl in Malaysia is pictured here with all the foods she ate in a week. Um, she especially likes cake, porridge, uh, spaghetti with carbonara, and then she and her parents grow bok choy and spinach on their balcony. Frank from Senegal is pictured with all of his favorite foods. And as you can probably tell from the photo, Frank loves everything, but he especially likes fish and he likes to eat the nuts that grow on the tree outside of his house. So I'd like to encourage you to stop and think about what kind of foods do you like to eat? And what do you tend to eat week to week? And you can write your answers in the chat. You can turn to somebody at home and answer there, or just think about this to yourself. So just like those students in the photographs, you can create your own food journal. Again, this is thinking about what kind of nutrients are coming in, what kind of nutrients do I need, and noticing what you're eating over a period of time. It could be a couple days, it could be a week, it could be longer. And there are so many ways to keep track of this. You could take photographs like this person has done here. You could write it down. You could tell someone about it. You could use emojis or some other digital representation, but it's just important to start noticing what you're eating. So after that period of time, whether it's a day or a week or longer, stop and look back at your record and think about what you notice. Are there any patterns? Do you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables? What's your favorite food? Do you eat that favorite food every day or is it only on special occasions? And think about the nutrients that you might need as a young growing person. Are you tending to choose foods that help you get those nutrients? to help your body grow, to be healthy, and stay healthy. But as you're looking at your record, it's important to remember we're in the middle of a global pandemic and not everybody is able to access the food that they want in a way that's safe right now. And even in normal times, we can't always get the foods that we need or that we want. And that's okay. It's important when you're looking at this record to not feel badly about things that are outside of your control. But if you are in the position to help others, be a good global citizen and think about how to help people get access to the nutrients that they need. And if you want a challenge, you can try our game, Pick Your Plate, the Global Guide to Nutrition. The link is gonna be provided in the chat. Um, this game helps you do sort of like a virtual world tour of nutrition. And you can choose a country to go to like Benin or Finland or Australia. And you basically try to stay on budget, 
choose the nutrients that are going to create a balanced meal and uh, pick foods that you think will work for that balance. Uh, some countries are a lot harder than others, so I'm excited to see how you do. And if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about today, you can always reach out to us. Carol's email address is listed right there, and mine is too. And I'm always happy to answer any of your questions that you have about putting nutrients in your body that help you grow to be well and stay well. Carol, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so much, Logan. That was great. And I cannot wait to play Pick Your Plate. So I put the Pick Your Plate link um, in the chat box in case any of the students want to play it. Um, it's fun. It's hard to get a gold medal or even a, a bronze, but um, when you do, you feel really good about knowing um, the nutritional guidelines of all of these countries around the world. So I, I do hope that you'll try these activities and I certainly do hope that you'll keep track of the foods that you eat so that you better understand whether you're balancing your nutritional intake um, based on your weeks long kind of investigation of the foods that you are consuming. Um, so, you know, as our good friend, Dr. Swami Nathan, who's the chief scientist at the World Health Organization would say, um, scientists and teachers and authors like Logan can tell you the answers to questions that you might have about food and nutrition, but the best way to learn this is by also doing this and discovering it for yourself. So now I'm really excited. I wanna also introduce you to our dear new friend, Dr. Uh, Panagis Galicetos. So I'd like, I like to call him Dr. G. Um, so Dr. Galicetos is a medical doctor and a medical health specialist. He's also an assistant professor. So he is also a teacher at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland, which is in the United States. He founded something that we are so appreciative of. It's called Medicine for the Greater Good. And it's a novel medical initiative that's impacting over 10,000 people who live in Baltimore City. And it's looking at their health and their wellness, while at the same time trying to create physician citizens. He also directs the Tobacco Treatment Clinic at Johns Hopkins and has published over 40 research articles with a focus on health equity, community engagement, and the impact of health outcomes. His book, Building Health Communities, has been described as a book that is literally has the potential to save lives. He also has a TED Talk that discusses the need for healthcare to engage with the local community for health equitable outcomes. During the pandemic, which we're all experiencing, Dr. Gelly Setos and colleagues coordinated community engagement to ensure that all populations are able to access COVID-19 updates and resources in an effort to assure compliance with public health requests, whether it's wearing a mask, um, physically distancing. He cares deeply about helping to protect you and others from COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. G. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, when I was given this opportunity to join you all, to be invited into your own communities, wherever you may be in this world, I thought about long and hard how to best introduce myself and to continue motivating you all to be the next global citizens to really change this world. And so I'm gonna just talk about what I know best, which is myself, but to recognize that whatever, whenever you get asked what you wanna be when you grow up, you don't have to look too hard. You have to look at your own personal story, your own personal narrative, and how that's influenced you to become the person you are today. And whether you wanna pursue health through being a doctor or pursue health through being an engineer, as we heard from our earlier colleague with uh, technology, health will always be important. And I wanna stress that, stress that because you might say, well, that's not surprising hearing health from a doctor, but please understand as a physician, health oftentimes for us is more synonymous with you know, the science of health, but specifically medicine, where we look at pathology, disease, and so forth. But health is so holistic. It takes into account what you eat, takes into account where you live, takes into account your day-to-day -day activities, your hobbies, and so forth, really just takes into account your own identity. So how does that, how did that play a role for me? And so I grew up in, in the United States in a city called Baltimore. 
It's not too far from Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. But I grew up in an area of Baltimore that is rather unique. I, for instance, didn't even speak English, the native language of America, until I was five years old because my parents were immigrants. They came from Greece, they came into Baltimore City, and I grew up in a community where all we talked was Greek. Actually, the first time I went to school and I heard English, I was like, who, what language is that? I was uh, taken aback a little bit. But as, the reason why I stress this is because growing up in this immigrant community, our culture did not change even though we assimilated to the new country we lived in. And that culture was rooted in one person helping the other. My mom, she was a seamstress. If someone had a torn shirt, she'd go over and sew it. My aunt was an amazing cook. So if someone was hungry, maybe a long day at work or school, she would go and offer that. And I would witness firsthand as a child how one's neighborhood, how one's environment could offset any gaps one individual may have, right? Maybe someone needed extra assistance with their homework or extra assistance with working with their home. We all had a community member that can help fulfill those gaps. And then ultimately, I led a life, I, I'll spare you in this very abbreviated version of my life, I, I chased down science. I wanted to become a doctor for many, many reasons, but a lot of it because my community believed in me. And I became a doctor, and then I had the honor to work at the hospital that literally was in the backyard of my community. Johns Hopkins is located, at, if I had a soccer ball, I could kick it from my home to the hospital. That's how close Johns Hopkins is. And I got to go there and I got to train and be a doctor there. And during my time there, I completely, my, my heart was broken. Let me put it that way. I got to see medicine's limitations firsthand, right? I could sit back and describe so many diseases down to the genetic level, right? I could, I could, I could, I could shower my patients with tons of information and science, but the challenge was that, that wouldn't really make an impact on their health, right? If they left the hospital and went to an area where it was hard to find nutritious food, it was hard to find a park, it was hard to ignore the violence that was happening there, whatever a doctor prescribed for them or recommended to them, it would easily be offset. And so as, as Ms. Carroll mentioned earlier, I discovered, I helped create an initiative called Medicine for the Greater Good. And MGG, the initials, the purpose of that initiative was to take doctors of the 21st century and let them understand that medicine and its impact in health, on health, cannot be maximized, cannot reach its full potential within the confines of a hospital wall. If we are truly dedicated to making our communities healthier, we can't just sit in the hospital. We have to go outside of it. We have to go into someone's community. We have to maybe not walk in their shoes, but walk next to them and enjoy that understanding of what it means to live in their neighborhood and in their community. And only then, and only then, can we help create equitable plans that the patients can learn in order to best promote health for themselves. And I say this because to me, that didn't seem like a revolutionary idea, even though others have said that. To me, it just meant going back to my roots, understanding where I grew up, understanding how community, how your neighborhood can always help fulfill whatever gaps an individual has. We are so much stronger together than we are individually. And so if you want to recognize to promote health in any context, I strongly encourage doing it unified, doing it as one, doing it as a group, because only then can you hit the maximal potential of yourselves and of your community in order to promote health and wellness and to prevent disease. And that concept isn't even, is, is, is so much true in today with COVID-19. And the last closing comment I'll make is, as you heard earlier, we are engaged with the community during COVID-19. And one of our outcomes has been going into the schools and talking to the children about how you all can play a role in ending this pandemic. And sometimes I get a child snickering at that, but it's true, right? We talk about how it spreads. And so if we take the behaviors of how it spreads and undo that, right? Physical distancing and so forth and hand hygiene, we could all stop this pandemic today. So the power is in your hands to make your communities healthier. It's all about you and recognizing what your identity is and finding that profession that aligns with your values and goals so you can maximize the best outcome you can 
for the world. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over uh, to you, uh, Carol, and others for any questions. Wow, I think uh, I've got to say that Dr. G, uh, Dr. Galiasetos, that was really inspiring, okay? So what I, I liked on that side of it, and, and uh, before we get to the question side of it, you talked about one point about being in the community, getting a feel for it, being there. And I think it's so true because sometimes in, in this world, we, we look sometimes from a telescope far away at a situation and we look at our ideas, our calculations, our spreadsheets, and we make decisions that are not about the community we're living in, not feeling how it works as well. Um, so I think that, that, that was quite interesting and quite transformative in terms of the way of seeing things. And sometimes we are too distant. We don't understand how it is on the ground, how that community works and how to get in there. And I think the idea of doctors on the ground, they're seeing what's happening, a stone's throw from your house, uh, was truly inspiring as well. Now, we're having a doctor here ready for us, and uh, we're going to put some questions to you about some health questions to see how they go. Uh, we're going to go around the world. So uh, and I think that our first question coming in is from Uganda and from Catherine in Uganda. Let's see there. My name is Catherine Namara from Uganda. Considering the future of medicine and how dynamic it is, how would you say the role of nutrition can be modified to harness its benefits and enhance its role in promoting good health? That's a fantastic question of how nutrition can play a role in promoting health. So the, the, the simple and maybe to some extent obvious answer is that good nutrition 100% can help us achieve the, uh, the equity that we all deserve in regards to our own health. We saw those pictures earlier from the Smithsonian of these young children eating what my first glance of it, yes, diverse diets, but a well-balanced diet. And in my line of work, you know, we often emphasize how so much of the vitamins and minerals people take in are immediately used by the body's immune system, for instance, right? Like all the vitamins you take in, all the minerals, your immune system takes them on and gets energized from it. So meaning if you do get an infection, you'll be able to combat it so much more effectively. Yes, you may still get a fever or a hiccup here and there, but I promise you, you, you won't be suffering dire consequences. So nutrition is pivotal. And I say this because in 2020, right, the pandemics that existed before COVID-19, or pandemics of, of diseases that we call non-communicable, meaning I can't pass it on to you. Th these are diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure. Those are very common and we strongly have recognized that they are linked to not just your community, not just your neighborhood status, but also the food you take in. And so nutrition, a well-balanced meal can pre help prevent the prior pandemics that we, that we had in this world, such as diabetes and high blood pressure. And not only that, they can help you achieve your best, right? From cognition, right? To the way you think, and to the way you promote your own health and so forth. So I'm a firm believer, actually, when we go out into the communities, discussions of food is easily the top choice, the top conversation that everyone has. And we discuss how we can all benefit one another with more diverse, nutritious diets. So that's a fantastic question that I think transcends every country and every culture. Wonderful and great to hear that from Uganda as well. So thank you very much for that question coming in. The second question here is actually quite linked to that one. Uh, we had a question coming in, sent in to us uh, via text or an email from Ian in Canada. Now, there was quite a long bit of text and Ian, I can't read it all out for you uh, on that side of it. Uh, but I think Ian was talking about the idea, you know, is can I really actually improve my immunity? We are in a pandemic right now. Uh, we are facing challenges globally. Uh, and we know it's not going away immediately. I know that, that, that we are working on the, on the vaccine program as well, but it's not going away immediately. And I was asking really, can I really eat myself towards a better immune system? So can I really, does it really work just by having certain things? And he probably he raised some questions about there are certain drinks out there that claim to give you immunity or better. So what, what's the facts behind this? What can I do to really improve that immune system? No, so that's a great question, by the way, an amazing question. And sometimes with these questions, we always look at maybe the, the flip side to that. So what if you were malnourished? Would you do well? When we knew people with malnutrition do worse if they get an infection such as COVID-19. So the flip to that would be, well, if I have a stable nutrition, would I be okay? And so the answer is yes, but still recognize that it's there's so many other variables at play. But nutrition, the reason why we emphasize that is because it is the one thing that you can control you know what you put into your body the diet you eat and so forth that is up to you to help modify it 
And in a time like this, why not prepare your body with all the vitamins and minerals it can it can use in order to maybe not prevent catching the virus, right? But prevent it from ever becoming a severe disease like COVID-19. Now, that's one thing. And the second question I get often asked is, and then what foods? What foods should I take in? And the one thing I want to emphasize here is, and I know you'll, you'll have many amazing speakers, intelligent human beings, but none of us can match Mother Nature. The way she has prepared foods from spinach to the green leaves and so forth, that by far is the best way to take in foods. And I say this because I'm, I'm a humble scientist and the complexity of how vitamins and minerals come into our bodies through the leaves we eat or the foods we take in, we can never match that or replicate it with vitamins and mineral supplements and so forth. I'm, I'm not dismissive of them, I think they're fine, but I would try to eat as much natural food as you can, foods that would put a smile on any mother's face. So yes, can you boost your immune system through food? You can. Will that help you with COVID-19? It potentially can, 100% it potentially can. Really important question that to be answered. Thank you very much for the that side of it. So go natural, uh, go for the foods that your mum would like, um, <laughs> keep it green, keep it fresh, yeah, avoid all that processed stuff. And I right. think that's an important message and that can really support us the pandemic by keeping ourselves healthy. Thank you. Um, we're going to head out now to a beautiful place now in, in Bermuda. And we've got a question for you. This is an interesting question. I think it's, it's, it's a, possibly a hard question. Um, so let's see if we can get across to Bermuda and see what they're trying to say to you. Hello, my name is Sam, and I go to Chatmore British International School in Bermuda, where I'm head boy. My question today is what are the prospects of herd immunity as it relates to the coronavirus? Oh, it's a great question. So herd immunity implies that enough people in a population have gotten an infection where we have a memory to it where we can kind of hold off, meaning whenever we get a new infection and our body's immune system has to recognize it for the first time, oftentimes that delay in recognition allows the virus or the infection to just kind of grab one cell to the next, replicate and ultimately cause a disease. And when you have an immunity or prior memory to it, the second that virus comes in there, the body's prepared, everyone's on defense, the virus gets uh, taken care of either without ever developing symptoms or maybe some mild, mild symptoms. Now, in order to have this type of herd immunity, every infection, we kind of take into account, well, how does it spread? And this one spreads through the air and how it contagious is it and it's infectious period. And we know uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be infectious for anywhere from two weeks to up to 30 days. Taking all these variables into account, we create a number uh, called the reproduction number that tells us how many people need to achieve herd immunity in order for this pandemic to be somewhat behind us. And that number is somewhere between 60 to 80%. That is very high when we look at this infection causing a pandemic, right? Six billion people throughout the world susceptible to this. So herd immunity of 60 to 80% of six billion people, unfortunately, it's gonna be a lot of people and a lot of lives that could have been prevented from being lost. So that's why to some extent, pursuing herd immunity we know it, it's it's especially with a virus that has a mortality rate of about three to five percent and a morbidity rate, meaning causing rather severe illness in one out of six is not the approach we should take when we have the ability to have science help us. One way to gain herd immunity without having to go through a bad disease like COVID-19 is a vaccine. And that's what we're in a race for at the moment, right? Where, where you are seeing the pace of science and the pace of intellectual thought really help promoting the next level of combating mother nature's pandemic. So herd immunity, we want to achieve it, don't get me wrong, but we want to achieve it without losing any lives. And the best way to do that is a vaccine. And that means vaccinating about 60 to 80% of the world's populations. So we are, that's what we're trying to strive for. Trying to achieve it another way, just naturally, that means many lives will be lost and we're nowhere close to that. I think the last numbers are about 25 million people with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infections throughout the world. So we have, if we're relying on just herd immunity to happen naturally, we are not even a, you know, a 5% there. So we have a long ways to go. But for humans, we have science. We can get there in a more efficient and ethical way through the vaccine.